What I'd prefer to do is to make sure you all have um, a focus on the slides. I'm going to stand over there to the side. So I suppose my point, um, you don't know anything about me, and uh, I, it's um, incumbent on me to explain a little bit about my background and where I'm coming from. So I prepared this slide to show you my approach to safety. So in these four roles I've done over the last number of years, in each case I, was, um, I, was, I had a day job. Right, so the, currently I'm Managing Director of Collin Construction since January 2015. I'd worked for the company for four years between 78 and 82. Uh, then before that I was in Langer Work, I was business unit leader for the, a huge um, construction business south of um, uh, Birmingham and in Wales. And before that I was a senior project director for a huge project in uh, Australia. And before that I was 25 years of McInerney as I was Managing Director. But in each case, I don't agree with the separation between uh, safety leadership and operational responsibilities. So my message to you here today is that in each of those roles on uh, day jobs, I also took full accountability for safety and, and looking after the people that were working for me. So I currently am chairman of Colin uh, SHEQ, that's Safety, Health, Environmental and Quality Committee. I was chairman of the Mission Zero Safety Leadership Team in Langer Rourke, and I was, I was chairman of Chevron's Incident and Injury Free Leadership Committee in, in Australia and Barrow Island, and I established the Safety Committee Rotating Director 24-7 and Safety Certification we, we um, achieved for the first time in McInerney's in that time. So I hope you get that clarity of responsibilities, and there's no room for hiding when it comes to safety. And my message goes back to 1966, and uh, I was telling... Sorry, Stephen, doing something wrong here now. So the first slide I put up here is, um, I, I kind of separate this presentation today into two, two parts. I'm taking you through what I regard as my personal journey to safety. And then I'm going to, yeah. Okay, very good, I'm listening. And uh, this is 1966, and uh, when I was a kid, I used to get into a huge amount of trouble. And um, I, I was usually caught, but there was a lot of things I was blamed for that I didn't do. And this, for me, was a, a changing point in my life. Next year, my dad is dead, 50 years. And this is a couple of years before he died. It's 1966. I was telling Caroline there, I drove in from Donabate this morning. This is in Donabate. It's on a, in a bungalow my aunt bought in the 50s um, out of the children's allowance, would you believe, for 600 pounds. And this particular day, I was out there with my dad. who's a very shy man. And on the slide on the left is my dad teaching me how to drive. So um, you'll learn a little bit about him in the next slide. But um, I was sitting on a cushion. And if anybody's tried to drive a Beetle, it has a, I had to have a cushion. And there's a, a floor-mounted clutch. So it's very difficult to get it to start. And I don't know why he took the time out that day to do that for me when I was only 11 years of age. The next slide clearly shows I was in control of the car myself. And I did, in doing my preparation for you today, I, I've estimated I've driven between 900,000 and a million kilometers in my life. My job has always involved in me driving. And I'm going to touch on that later and getting safely to work. And Joe and I are doing a bit of work on that at the moment. And uh, so I was in control of the car I was driving uh, when I was 11 years of age. And that was hugely important to me. I've had no incidents in 46 years and, and under a million kilometers. So I think that's a fairly powerful message. If you get the right training and people trust you, it can have a very powerful impact on your life. So why would my father want to do that? Uh, the photograph here, I'll try and do this right, Stephen. That man there is my father, and that's him in 1935 in the Air Corps. So he, he knew a little bit about driving. And the slide on, on the right-hand side, that's my dad on the right-hand side. And uh, that's Captain um, Bolger. And that's a DC-3. And during the war years, my dad uh, flew the DC-3 as co-pilot between Dublin and uh, for Aer Lingus. He was in the Air Corps for eight years, nine years in the 30s, and he joined Aer Lingus in 39. He died in 1969. And he was a self-taught aeronautical engineer, started out as a mechanic. And I was asked by the Dublin Airport Authority, a very interesting client. Um, we've done four projects for them. And what I like about them is they have a safety leadership team. It's the only company in Ireland I'm aware of that does it. We meet every month. And they asked me to present to the DAA. And I was very nervous about it. And uh, so what I decided to do was talk about my father, right, because it was in the airport. So my dad's job essentially was to, when he was on duty, he would sign off that aircraft or any aircraft. And he was the one who... Uh, Taught, worked on the team to bring in the 747 into Aer Lingus. He would have signed out that aircraft as fit for purpose, and then the captain would, would um, fly it. So in terms of capability, accountability, accountability being the important word for my dad and for the pilot, and teamwork, that's a pretty solid team. It's only two people, but they both represent big, big teams behind them. And my dad, in his uh, career in Aer Lingus, never had an, an accident. So I'm very proud of that fact. 
Um, so this is the, my initial career in, um, in column between 78 and 1982. And what's interesting about it, it's the first time I remember somebody t teaching me about safety and just safety. So in 1978, a man called John Walsh came in and did a toolbox talk. Box talk. This was a highly complex civil engineering project. We're a general building contractor now, but in those days we were a civil engineering contractor, high risks. We were building, we were building a coffer dam 25 meters below ground and a highly, highly complex site, and we didn't have any accidents. But I couldn't believe it when I turned up in my first month in Colin in 2015, and I went along for my safe pass. I had to make sure that I had my safe pass before I turned up in any of our projects. And lo and behold, I'm looking at this man as presenting the safe pass. The thing about the safe pass course, it's only one day, but by God, when you finish it, you know legally what your obligations are, and I love it. And it was only about two o'clock in the day I realized that it was the same John Walsh who had actually taken the toolbox talk in 1978. So how good is that? And I love that. Our company is 208 years old. We're um, owned by Neil Collin. And Neil is one of the only people I've met in my life who has a general concern for people's total well-being. He does not want me ringing my team at night time or sending them emails. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. It's a very, very good culture. I wanted to thank a few of our team here today. Joe O'Dwyer is our safety manager. We've got um, Sarah Heaps. We've got, uh, we got Anne Mallon. And we have uh, Orla Sweeney. Now, you have no idea the enthusiasm of my team. They're quite incredible, and you're going to learn a bit, a bit about that now. Go back to my earlier life then, to the 1984 to 2009. I worked Mac and Ernie's. And sometimes when you get into a position of power, it's very, very important you use that power in the right way. Now, in Ireland, the wonderful thing about legislation is it changed in 1989. It moved away from just the Factories Act to the broader piece about people's welfare and, and safety on sites. And in 1995, they brought in the, um, the guidelines about procedures, and that's really powerful. So I was appointed managing director in... Um, in 2002, so I decided at that stage, it was an opportunity to influence, and uh, because of the legislation, I felt I should go off and find out a lot more about it. So I appointed Barrett Chapman, and um, Barrett Chapman, uh, he was a young lawyer at that time, but I'd heard a bit about him, and he's a very close friend of mine now. He's now a partner in McCann Fitzgerald. And I worked with uh, Ollie Cody, who was our safety manager at the time. We established a national safety committee, established a regional safety committees, and we built best practice. That's a, a very big document there that sits in my office still. I'm very proud of it. That company is no longer in business, unfortunately, a hundred-year-old family business. So built best practice, and then I introduced a rotating director. So it wasn't just me that was taking the responsibility. I spread it around the, the regional directors in the west of Ireland, in Waterford, in the Midlands. And uh, they bought into it big time. I introduced 24-7. Every time there's an incident or an accident, I found in my life that 95% uh, of what you hear about that incident or accident is actually incorrect. So we have 24-7 if it's a high potential or an incident that's happened. And we find out what actually happened. We bring people into the room. Joe chairs the meeting. And we don't beat people up. We embrace it. And we say, listen, you've nothing to worry about. Just tell us what happened. We'll, we'll learn what happened. And uh, we'll roll out the lessons learned to the rest of the people in the business. And it's a really powerful engagement. And that's where we build our culture. So out of that, we applied for a safety certification, accreditation. And we achieved, I think, with the first general contractor in Ireland to get at the time, 2016. And interesting enough, there's a guy called um, Stephen Fulwell, whose name will come up again later on. So you need to pay attention. And he, he was the auditor, and he said, um, he said about us, uh, I, most everything I've given you today, I'm going to give you evidence and you go off and research it. So this is the Health and Safety Review. It comes out every month, and this is, uh, I think, January, February 2006. And he said that... Um, uh, the system that he looked at was among the best he had seen in any industry. Now, I, I take great pride in that, and our team took great pride in that. And um, there's a lot of information around that. If you're serious about learning about how you change a culture or build a culture, you should go in and read that, because uh, we, I still use an awful lot of what we, we did today. I rang Stephen yesterday to tell him that I was going to quote him today, and he was very happy with that. Uh, and Stephen was the man who told... Um, Joe and myself and uh, Rebecca Riley's in Sweden today. She rang me this morning to wish us the best of luck. She heads up our quality and we work hand in glove. Joe and myself, David Lee, our, our um, construction director, who you're going to see later. So Stephen Fulwell mentioned for the first time about ISO 45001. So that's in 2015. And we thought, hmm, that's interesting. Um, so we'll, we need to learn a little bit more about that. And let's go after it. So when I finished uh, for McInerney's in Ireland 2008, um, I went to Australia. When I was growing up, you went to Australia, were never seen again, back in Ireland, right? But, uh, so my family were challenged by that. But um, I was asked to head up a $900 million project to design and build a village for 4,000 people on an island halfway between Perth and Darwin, uh, 90 kilometers offshore. So the first thing I had to do was go over to Thailand. We took an old um, derelict uh, container facility of 80, uh, almost 900,000 square foot, and we had to build a new factory, uh, refurbish it. And out of that, we had to construct a village for 4,000 uh, people and ship it then to Fremantle, a port designed by an Irish engineer. 
and uh, then up to Barrow Island, a long way away. So the round journey was about 6,000 kilometers. So what, what did we do? We, we were amazingly lucky. There was a man called Ian Leatham. You should look his name up on the web. He's unfortunately passed on in the meantime, but he was, you ever hear of a, a disaster called uh, Piper Alpha? And Ian was one of the few people who was, went in to high, try and help the survivors, and he survived himself. And he was our safety lead in Thailand, right? This is in Bang Nan in Bangkok. I'd never been there before. And I, I went down there to get the first shipment out, which was leaving on the 11th of March 2010. I had to make sure that we had it on, on, on the ship to make sure we would get our project started in, uh, in Australia. So what do we do? So we tried to build a culture whereby we would... Um, we would uh, Work with the work with upwards 1,600 people working in the factory, and um, this was our first main event, right? Where we celebrated half a million man hours without an LTI. I'm in that slide, but also as our clients, all the senior people in Chevron in uh, from Houston who were based in Australia, and the senior management team on the project. So we were so pleased to get the half a million. So we stuck with it. We got up to two million man hours. And we're celebrating with the workforce. We gave lots of rewards and recognition for good behavior. We got to five million. Well, when we finished that project, and it took us two and a half years, we, I had to leave on the 11th of March to go back to, the, uh, to Perth so I could support the team on, the, on Barrow Island to build that village for 4,000 people. So we got to 9.8 million man hours LTI free. And that's quite a staggering performance. If you work out the man hours and how much man hours that is, that's a staggering amount of money. So that was world-class performance, fully supported by our client. A lot of clients aren't interested in safety. So it's an absolute pleasure and joy to work with a company you're seriously interested in safety. Now, why would you pick Barrow Island? Barrow Island is a, a Class A nature reserve. So Rebecca, unfortunately, isn't here today. This is a Class A nature reserve since 19. And there are 26 species that are indigenous only to Barrow Island. It's quite a remarkable place to work. You see these, these creatures will come up to you at the airport. They're, they're 1.5 meters long. They're docile. They don't scare. They don't worry about people. So you'll see later on that um, we, we respected that. And every container we sent to that island had to be surrounded in plastic, had to be fumigated. And I just thought from your own point of view, it would be good to see what a, what a village for 4,000 people looks like. So this is a $57 billion project. Our scope was for $900 million. And that was just brownfield and red dust when we started, right, in November 2009. And I got PC on that in uh, the 19th of December 2012. So what you're looking at there, this is, the highest, this is an island that has the highest land speed of the world, 429 kilometers per hour, Barrow Island. And as I say, 90 kilometers offshore. And up there in that slide, there's Darwin up there and there's Perth. So every week for four years, I flew from Perth in, in a jet that Chevron uh, released 100-seater jets, and we, we supported the project from Perth. Uh, and I had a team working on a three-week on and one-week off um, roster. So that was the first cluster we built. That's effectively equivalent to a 325-bed, two-story hotel. Because it's got the highest land speed in the world, it had to be cyclone-proof. And so a couple of cyclones hit when we were building it. So it's two stories, and um, it's a very, very high quality. We could feed 1,500 people at a sitting, and we designed all of that. Mike Regan, who's the Colin um, design lead at the moment, is our, uh, was the design lead for that project as well. Um, what about safety? This, uh, there's a company called JMJ. They're currently advising ESP in Ireland. I looked out my window one day and I saw Laurie Perrette and I couldn't believe it. So th we got together for two days. And this is our client, Donna Park, a remarkable woman. And um, Brian Pullum was my uh, project director. And the team, we got together for two days and we talked about what, what, what is it that um, you have to do to make a difference in safety. And what it is is this. You've got to talk to people, show them respect. You, go, you don't walk by and you sign a charter at the end of the two days. And it's a really powerful thing. So I remember what I was saying to you about uh, my role as senior project director, but I was also offered to be uh, chairman of the Incident and Injury-Free Leadership Committee. Now, most people believe, don't believe that you can get to incident-free. And uh, this is um, Bob. Bob was the construction director for that $57 billion project. He sat in on my committee, and Donna was my counterpart on the client side. So we actually got to incident-free, and it took me a long time. And this is, my, this is the, the journey I took. So. Um, I had a project leader on the project, and these are our incidents. Now, an incident in, in oil and gas is only, you might nip your finger, it might be near miss. It's not stuff that we're used to. So there's my trend, and this is for the first 18 months. So I tried everything in my power to try and reverse that trend. And about here, I realized I hadn't talked to the supply chain. So that was a serious lesson learned for me. So I invited my supply chain to a major event in Perth, and they all turned up. It still didn't crack it. And I, I had a project leader working on the project from the beginning, and I tried everything in my power for him to talk about safety, uh, getting to incident and injury free, not talking about production. He was a brilliant production person. And eventually I told him, and one day we had an incident, I wanted to fly up to the island. He said, well, I don't really think it's a good idea to fly up to the island. I said, well, I, that's, that surprised me. So cut a long story short, 
I, I notified, I was reporting to three managing directors, and I told them that I was flying up to the island and I was going to stand down our project leader. So I went up to the island, I stood down, and I had to go on to the project myself for six weeks. And the change was instantaneous, right? So we took, I had to bring a new project leader in, and uh, that took me about six weeks. And then we brought the safety performance, it got better and better and better. We actually took it down to zero instance at here. For the last 18 months of the project, we had actually no instance. So it is possible. And these are all the steps that it would have taken on the way. So if you ever want to study that, yeah, come back to me and I'll show you the things you have to do if you're going to get to world-class safety. It's not easy, trust me, but it's worth doing, it's worth getting there. It's the most invigorating place to get to. Um, so this was the finished project. Um, why would I show you this slide, right? Um, we, we were recognized by Chevron for having been innovative in the way we protected the indigenous species in Barrow Island. We didn't damage anybody or anything or any animal. So we, we were thrilled with that recognition. We exceeded 2 million man hours LTI free on the site. When we got out of the factory, we got everything on the site. We got to world class performance on the site. And these were equivalent to 4,000 ensuite bedrooms to a very high standard. Every one of those bedrooms cost $110,000 to build. Um, so that was part of my experience, and it changed my life. I went to, uh, I made redundant when I was in Ireland by Mac and Ernie's after 25 years. I wasn't in a good place in my head. So when I got to Australia, I learned to open up a lot more and be be open with people and give a bit of yourself away, and I'm doing that with you now this morning. Then I went to um, run Lang O'Rourke's business in uh, London for two years. This was the most challenging project I've ever had anything to do with. This is the tallest building in London City. It's the Leadenhall building, and Steve Cork, who passed away four weeks ago, was the project director on that. I've never met anybody like him. But we had to have an extreme height safety team working above this level. This was above St. Mary's Square. There are people walking by the bottom of this building every day. Hundreds of people. If anything fell off that building during construction, they would be killed. So one of the th things that uh, Ray O'Rourke is passionate about is uh, DFMA, Design for Manufacturing Assembly. 78% of that building, believe it or not, was pre-assembled off-site and lifted into position. And uh, it's 54 stories high, and it joins that square. There was no serious accident. Many incidents, many near misses, but we had no serious accidents. Specialist safety team for working at extreme, extreme heights. And we interviewed, because the getting up and down the building alone was a major challenge, so we safety notices issued by text to mobiles so people could be notified instantaneously of any of challenges. So this is the Colin, I'm moving on now, I joined Colin and I got a phone call uh, to go back to Colin in 2014, I joined in January 2015 and then I, I started to work with a team that are just so enthusiastic, it is unreal. So uh, when I arrived in, I learned about an accident that happened in quarter four 2014. What happened was a, a teleporter on the site we're building up in Tallacross, actually collided with the bus. How somebody wasn't seriously injured is beyond me. So the first thing I had to try and figure out, how were we going to change our culture and prevent some things like that happening? So uh, we talk, I talked to, to Joe. Joe was appointed um, uh, safety director. And we decided maybe the best thing to do, we, to trust somebody who wasn't in the business, to come in and look at us and tell us maybe what they thought. And it's just going to walk through this. Uh, this is the story. And um, uh, what's wrong with the status quo? We were getting A classification safety for three years before and year on year. So that's not a bad place to be. So let's find out if we have an issue. Why not try a gap analysis? Let's ask Stephen Fulwell to undertake this. You might remember Stephen was the auditor who audited us in, in McInerney's in 2006. And I trusted him and I brought him in and introduced him to Joe. So let's build a safety management system based on this gap analysis, which we did. Why not consider an international safety standard in addition to the safety? So we said, let's look at uh, ISO standards. So um, Stephen then mentioned, mentioned this new ISO safety standard, 45,001. So we were intrigued by that, but we parted in the background. 18,001 was the relevant standard at the moment. We still had to get to the point where we're going to get uh, accreditation for 9,000, uh, 14,000, and uh, 18,000. So we, we asked, we did all the work. We did our preparation. We, we, we'd set a target maybe a year out that we go to the NSA and ask them for uh, a view. Oh, my God. As soon as Rebecca and Joe went to talk to the NSAI, how good was that? They said, listen, you guys should go for this now. So they gave us an opinion. They were so positive from the outset that it just energized the team. So we achieved ISO accreditation, and it was a huge milestone for the team. However, we, we, met an, we hit an obstacle, as you always do. We assumed having the best management system would be a game changer. It wasn't. We had a serious near miss in our Abbey Street project and had to rethink our strategy. So what do we do now? Let's rely on lessons learned. So thinking in terms of previous experience in the past, my boss when I was in Australia for Kent was a guy called Hugh, Hugh O'Donnell. He retired very young, 
uh, from Kent's, and he set up a company called Ingenium. So he, that's all about safety leadership, and he is a leader, and I trusted him, and we explained our goal. So he came in and worked with us to do the following things that I'm going to take you through now. So we put a plan together with him, and we rolled it out. So this is Crow Park Safety Event number one, November 16. Operations team met to discuss accountability and, and establish our vision. So if I'm in, in anybody's company, I will say the following to them. I say, I'm accountable for the safety of all the people in our projects and our supply chain. But I will hold people to account. I'll hold Joel to account. Joel's here with me. And uh, I'll hold Joel to account to have the best management systems in the country. This man here is David Lee. He's a lot older than he looks. His father worked in the business before him. David is in Seattle this week in a safety leisure to visit as one of our clients. So David and Joel, myself and Rebecca are joined at the hip when it comes to anything and we trust each other implicitly. So Hugh O'Donnell, that's him in the background there. We invited all our operations team. We made it very clear to our operator. I did. I said, I'm holding you to account now. Don't, it's not anybody else's responsibility. If we're running projects and you're learning work areas, it's incumbent on you to take responsibility for that. That was Joe. That's a measure of the team that you're dealing with. They lined up all our calling cars beforehand and they had somebody take a photograph of them. They're proud of what they do. And we have a great gender balance, as you'll see later in that team. So it's a very, very successful team. So out of that event in Crow Park, we come up with our vision to be recognized as a leader in safety and project execution in the markets in which Collins operates. So at the moment, we're Germany, we're Sweden and Ireland. To help us to achieve our vision, we will do those things. We've signed up to that, all of our operations team, with 120 people in the room. So that was the first step. This is the second step. Uh, Crow Park safety event number two, May 2017. This is, remember on the curve and everything was going wrong when I was in Australia, three quarters away up that curve, I hadn't spoken to the supply chain. So we decided we'd invite 200 um, managing directors and directors of our supply chain. Um, now, this man here on the left is Donald Hennessy with the company 25 years, a quantity surveyor, but he's not a normal quantity surveyor. He gets safety. So uh, he, he, he headed up that event. I asked him, would he? David did the first one and Donald did the second one. So we, we, uh, again, we, we were uh, supported by Hugh O'Donnell and we broke into eight groups and it was amazing to see the interaction that took place in each of those groups with our supply chain. And this is what our supply chain came up with. But now this is, our, uh, this is our charter, right? And there's a lot of information. There's our supply chain. They've all signed up for it. So how powerful is that? We've taken ownership, right? And we're very proud of the fact that we respect our supply chain and work closely with them. That wasn't the end of the journey. Crow Park safety event number three, September 17. Joe and David, David Lee is our construction director. You would have seen him earlier on. They'd seen, uh, met a lady called Annette Tierney, and she, had, she basically reenacts incidents and events that have taken place in the past. You do it in your presence. So we brought our, uh, we invited some clients in, all our team this time, not just our operations team, all our quantity surveyors as well. And again, this is what you're dealing with. You know, the team kind of line up all the cars because they're very proud of the company that they're part of and the team they're part of. And this is a group of upwards of 160 people. And we reenacted a very serious event that took place in uh, Heathrow, Air uh, Heathrow Airport. And basically, they, they took us right back to five days beforehand. And they asked for advice. Why? They asked us to engage with the actors on the stage who were fully familiar with everything that had happened. And to put your head in a different space, all of a sudden, you feel responsible. And it was a really powerful thing to do. So that was a great event that uh, we did in Crow Park. And I think our team really benefited from that. One other thing, right? So we're planning the next event. So we're not finished. This is a constant, right? So plan, planning an event in Crow Park number four, quarter three, 2018, staff wellbeing workshop and attendance is mandatory. So 45,001, the great thing about it is it does a number of things that are different. It actually looks outside of the box. Just been looking after people's safety is not enough. How do people get to work? You know, what about their all around us, the holistic well-being? So we, we, we've, we're, we have a very good thing in the company, and it's the Colin Fit Club. In the first quarter of every year, it's grown out to about 30 people. You know, some, the person who's won it the previous years takes responsibility for having a real go at losing a bit of weight and getting a bit fitter. And uh, I'll tell you a little story now. James won it this year, and James is the grandson of, of Dan McInerney. Right? So you have that link between two family companies. Colin, 208 years old, uh, McInerney were 100 years old. He won it, Dan's uh, grandson. He lost 14.5% of his body weight. So what we're going to do now, we put a committee in place. The committee is, and we, we put committees in place to try and make differences. And change management is the hardest thing you'll ever do in a business. So Cara Stewart is our company secretary, and she has a passion for people's well-being. So Cara's brought in this work at software. What it does is it allows you as an individual to build a little plan around how you're going to get fitter, how you're going to get healthier. And... Um, We've now taken in uh, Shane Lyons, who's a fitness expert and a, is going to give us nutritional advice on flexibility and posture, you know, sitting at your desk all day. 
Um, we talk a bit about mindfulness in a minute when I see one of the things Joe won an award for, you know, your personal well-being plans. Now, there's no harm in using things we use for safety, leading indicators all the time. Let's use it for people's safety. One of my team has got ill in the last month, so he's, we're working with him at the moment and trying to change his fitness. He's going through blood pressure, tablet change, he gets dizzy. That was a near miss for me. We had our 24-7 review, and we're now he's got his proactive diagnosis, and he's in office every day, and we're supporting him 100%. He's only one of 200. And we're, so we're going to effectively stand, extend this brilliant annual fitness club into something in a broader uh, base for the next three years. The committee is Cara. It's a ch chap called John Sweeney, or his dad. John has a very bad back. He stands at his desk now, and he uses Pilates to build his core strength, and is working brilliantly. So he knows what he's talking about. He was the centre half back for Kilmacud in 1995, and they won the club All Ireland title. And he's been with the company for 30 years. Our longest serving employee is Jimmy Small. He was 60 years with the company. His father worked with the company as well. And he, uh, Jimmy would have trained our, he was the, running the joinery workshop when I was there in 78. And he trained our se three uh, senior uh, construction directors, our managers. So that's the plan at the moment, right? Um, Joe uh, was approached by Fergal O'Byrne from the NSAI. And this is what you're dealing with with the NSAI. And asked us, would we launch with them 45,000 in one, we couldn't believe it. They've been watching us for the last two years on LinkedIn. This is the most complicated project we have in Abbey Street. This is an exoskeletal frame. The Lewis is outside the site. We're bringing in a Turkish uh, unitized system from Tur uh, to hang on the side of the building. There was a Presbyterian church built in uh, 1860, and the church hall sits inside that building. When Emma did the audit last Thursday, or last Tuesday, she couldn't believe, she couldn't find anything wrong. She said, that doesn't happen. So how good is that team? So we've now passed our ISO 45,000 and one. We're waiting for the certificate, which we expect this week. We think we might be the first global contractor to receive it, general contracting. There's other companies in Ireland have gone for it. Um, so this is interesting. We only prepared this for the, we hadn't, we don't focus on this, right? But effectively what you're looking at here is the decline in accident frequency plans since 2015. So that's impressive by any standards. Here's the, the, the this is the um, HSA reportable annual look. That's pretty healthy. And these are all the leading indicators. So you're looking at H, um, near misses. There's no near misses really in 2014, so we've embraced that, and we're bringing those up there. We embrace them. Good saves, this is if you see something good or you see something that's not good, you put in a little card, and, and that's gone really well. Look, that's changed, making a, a difference. NCRs as well. We don't have a history of NCRs in our business. That takes a bit of trust. So that's really proven to us that we're going in the right direction. Uh, so Joe and, and his team, and uh, you know, we've 33% um, men and women, and it's a really powerful and high-performing team. So that's the Eastern Award we got from NISA for the work we're doing. So we don't focus too much on them, but we like to participate and do our best. We're competitive. You know, uh, women in construction, that's the Czech team, a high-performing team. And we support the CIF and everything, all the initiatives they do around there. This is our Swedish team. They couldn't make the Crow Park event. So last Monday week, I was over in um, Sweden, and um, we had a really difficult winter in Sweden. And uh, so Jennifer, is, uh, f 14 years ago, she married Kieran. And 14 weeks after they got married, Kieran fell through a sheet of plywood, a high-rise building, and he was killed. And the story she told us, oh my God, I've never heard anything like it. And she eyeballed us and she told us, you can never walk by. So no matter what you do, no matter who you are, whatever your job is, no matter what you're doing, Jennifer's message to our team over in Sweden was you don't walk by. And they walked by in her, in her husband's case. So very, very impressive, uh, the story that she left with us. And uh, this is the presentation of a mindfulness campaign by the Health and Safety Authority in Dermot as well from the CIF around. You know, that thing, maybe Rosemary and I had a row last night. I came to work this morning. I was, my mind was full of that. I wasn't thinking of the work I should be doing today. So that mindful versus mindful business. And mindfulness is a big thing at the moment. So our team understand that. This is the most important meeting we have in the business, right? This is the whiteboard meeting. It's great fun. It takes about 20 minutes, shouldn't take any more. And we talk about the, the, the operations that are going on in the day and who's going to be on the site and who's at higher risk and simultaneous operations and all that good stuff. But we try and have a bit of fun. If you're late for the business, you get fined. If your phone goes off in the meeting, you're fined. Um, if you, you do something you shouldn't be doing, you're fined. And there's also a naughty club. So it's great fun. Now, we presented a cheque for 1700 to the Children's Hospital recently because out of the money raised at the back of the, the whiteboard meeting. Near misses I talked about earlier on. I won't dwell that, but we used this as our main theme for Safety Week in October last year. And uh, a one-minute stand-down for safety across the business as well. You know, we take it seriously. That's our head office team there in the top left, and these are our site teams across all the projects. 
Um, I'm a cyclist, so three years ago I said to the team, we're, we're based in the East Wall area for, since 1890, would you believe? And uh, so we, we raised 23,000 over the last two years, and we're doing it again this year. I was wondering what the response would be. I didn't realize I, the team I was working with. This is the turnout for raising money for our community. So we raise money for the elderly and the youth in the East Wall, for uh, Evenus, for the Women's Refuge, and for Manshed, for those men that are left behind when the wives have looked after them all their lives, like my wife looks after me, and they, they, they stay at home and they get depressed. So this thing about team, accountability, community, leadership, and culture, and we understand it. Uh, this is my safety plan. Every one of us has a safety plan. And uh, so you sign up to what you're going to do during the year. Now, that's all very well. So, you know, maybe you'll be impressed, maybe you won't be impressed. Maybe there's evidence to back everything that I've talked to you about today. I think the important thing to remember is that tomorrow's another day. You start again, you wipe the slate clean, and how's it going to go? You don't know. And uh, so the, the, the great uh, comfort I get is two things. One, the team I work with. They're world class. Uh, they want to be ahead of the curve, not behind the curve and chasing it. And the other thing with the whiteboard meetings, I know in all our projects, we have 16 projects live in Ireland, we have two in Sweden, that we'll have a whiteboard meeting in the morning and all my team will be at the whiteboard meeting that need to be there. And uh, that gives me huge comfort. So listen, thanks for your attention today. I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing you again. Cheers. Thanks.